Welcome to the Dennis Report. Today we're doing something special. We're going to explore the Myra Quarry just outside of Fredericton and speak to some of the residents who have been heavily impacted the past four or five years. The renewal for the quarry is coming up in mid-November, and that's the reason for doing the show now. We hope it captures your attention and that it draws some action as well. So to get us started, can you introduce yourselves to our audience, please? Judith Seymour. Uh, I'm chair of the local service district. Mm -hmm. uh, Nat Purcell. I used to live in Estes Bridge and do not anymore, but I lived for about four years enduring what was going on there. So hmm. I can speak to my experience quite willingly. And I'm Jerry McQuinn. Uh, I have been living on the railroad for five years uh, while the uh, Myra Quarry was constructed and uh, putting up with the nuisance every day. So does this story get into, um, there's so many different themes around it or tracks around it, so we'll touch on the environmental one at some point and we'll touch on the household impact at another. But one of New Brunswick's long-standing narratives is uh, economy. We need to create jobs, we need to drive the economy, and it tends to be an industrial kind of mindset or uh, business mindset. Um, can you speak to how that narrative made that quarry appear in the first place and then the impact it's had on, on you so far? So th the justification was we need to create jobs. Um, justification was that business is a good thing. But you've had the opposite experience. So do you want to wander into yes, the history uh, of the business side? I'm, I'm not against industrial operations. Uh, they have to be in the right spot. Uh, this uh, business started um, by, I, I guess it was uh, favoritism or whatever, uh, or money, I don't know, but um, uh, we had heard at the beginning that it was going to create uh, 12 jobs. Um, I, I, I tend to think that most of the jobs were moved from one other business, and uh, it is um, it is very frustrating uh, what they're doing from the very beginning. They um, it is uh, every day it is from six o'clock in the morning till uh, seven at night uh, we get uh, the noise uh, from backup alarms we get it from the trucks going up the hill uh, we get it from Jake brakes uh, we get it from very squeaky brakes coming down the hill and uh, it is terrible uh, and when they hit the road, uh, we get uh, the dust all the time coming into the house. Uh, so it's a constant uh, cleaning of everything you have from your cars to your house um, to yourself. And, and that's what uh, we're worried about, uh, our health in this here. So for, for the impact that it is doing on the community, uh, uh, we tend not to uh, have government people uh, look at it seriously. Hmm. So, uh, um, what can I say about that? It's 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 very uh, irritating. Hmm. You think that they would do health impact assessments, environmental impact assessments, and other things before they launch into something like this? And they didn't. We had to do the health impact assessments. We had to do the environmental impact assessments after the fact. We were told that they had done a thorough assessment of everything. And then we learned later that they had done absolutely nothing at all. How did we find this out? We did right to information requests up the wazoo. And we're sitting here today listening, for example, I'll just read you three things about the health impacts. It's uh, November 20th. I turned on the radio yesterday as I'm preparing dinner. CBC's house doctor Brian Goldman is disclosing findings linking exposure to chronic noise with a 30% higher likelihood of suffering a heart attack or a stroke. Second May 2019, just before we sit down with Blaine Higgs at a meeting. On the radio this morning, a Horizon Health stress coordinator was talking about how traumatic events like floods impact those victimized by them. Yes, cumulative traumas are more traumatic to rebound from than one-off traumas. Yes, the ramifications of families can be huge. Yes, such traumas can do trigger can and do trigger sleep and eating disorders, grief, anger, fear, and frustration. Yes, some people don't rebound easily. Yes, some people turn to drugs and alcohol to cope. 
A study from the University of California, Berkeley, has suggested the power that negative thinking holds by analyzing patients' answers to two questions. Quote, do you feel it is impossible for you to achieve the goals you've set yourself? And quote, do you get the feeling your future is hopeless? And is it difficult to believe things will get better for you? Participants who replied yes to both questions were three times more likely to suffer from cardiovascular disease such as heart attack or brain hemorrhage. It's not that we didn't know these things before 2018 and 2019. We, the community, actually circulated a post-traumatic syndrome disorder checklist to people in 2015 because we were getting nowhere with the Ministry of Health in this province. Mm -hmm. This checklist has things on it like rate yourself on the basis of your loss of interest in things that you used to enjoy. Rate yourself on feeling as if your future will somehow be cut short. Rate yourself on trouble falling or staying asleep. Rate yourself on feeling jumpy or easily startled. It goes on and on like this. Here's an example of one of the uh, ones that was handed over to me. X is marked extremely for some of these stressors. Write down the page. And this was one of many that I received and handed over to Jennifer Russell when she was the acting Minister yeah. of Health. We were sitting in her room and we showed her the dust and we, we, we showed her videos of what the impacts were on six or seven different people in our community. Mm. And that was, the, that was the end of it. We didn't hear anything back from her. Is this the way to build a better economy? No. Mm. Environmental impact assessments. Nobody did one. We live in one of the remaining critical species habitats for wood turtles. Nobody asked anybody in our valley whether there were wood turtles there. They just fast-tracked this particular initiative without asking anybody any questions about the environment. Okay, if we could pause there. Yeah. Thanks. Judith, it's good. I, I don't think anybody in the LSD uh, opposes industrial development, but I do think they oppose putting it in people's backyards. And maybe the government needs to look at what buffer zones really should be in place. In, in addition to the fact that there is the noise and the dust, um, Nats just talked a lot about the environmental issues and the fact that the choice for that quarry was exceptionally poor. It was at one time designated wetland area and Oddly enough, it no longer is, and perhaps it was necessary for it not to be for this project to, to proceed. I'm, I'm not aware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the themes was, you know, it's good for the economy, we need to create <coughs> jobs, but as you shared the information you had, <clears throat> it doesn't sound like a lot of jobs. You said 12 or so? 12. And, yeah. and you'd also kind of mentioned that it, uh, did it create new jobs or more jobs, or did it reallocate from other places? Because there's only a certain volume of work for quarries, right. mm -hmm. and we've got several quarries in Fredericton already. So did it create something new, or did it just redistribute something? It just moved a, yeah. a business from the upper Stone Ridge Road at Burt's Corner to our backyard. And, and uh, mm -hmm. there's some serious questions as to how that particular quarry in upper Stone Ridge was closed down. We have heard that it was closed down because a blast exceeded its uh, permit and blasted the foundation of a house in that area. Mm. So they closed it down over there. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of backstory here. Your question, though, how do you build better economies? Mm. Well, where to begin? Yeah. Would you like to hear some questions that have been asked and never been answered by the government about this quarry? So you want to wander into the process a little bit because there's the impact of what's already been decided. The fact that there's a renewal coming up very soon. Um, <coughs> squirrel moment off to the side. Is there any chance to have any input now that the renewal process is up? Given that you didn't have much input in the first place when the quarry was approved? Well, we, we've, had, uh, we've had a few meetings with the minister um, and uh, they seem to go on deaf ears. You, you meet with them there, you tell them you're concerned, and um, they uh, are asked to check on some things and, uh, and get back to. We never hear from them again. Uh, we've had three or four meetings, and this is the way it happens. Uh, they're doing uh, little things to 
maybe uh, lighten our anger, as you would say, um, and uh, the little things uh, may work. Uh, most of them don't work, and um, it is um, it is very um, very frustrating dealing with um, bureaucrats and politicians uh, because they uh, they don't uh, face uh, with you on this all the time. They don't um, uh, endeavor to really help you. You have to really. Uh, embarrass them. Hmm. I think we have significant concerns about health issues, both in relation to the people who live there and, and in relation to the at-risk species that also live there. Uh, and We started the process very early this spring with some meetings with ministers and, and eventually the Premier, which we were unable to achieve in the previous government in the previous five years. And we, we kind of tried to get them to understand that we needed to know how, much, how toxic this dust is. Mm. So uh, they managed to delay putting out any testing material until the middle of September, and so we're not in the busy, dusty, hot, dry part of summer, So, and some of that is still not functioning. Mm. So my guess is they don't want to know, because if they really did know, they might have to address it. And even though you bring all of the information you've gathered and all the research you've gathered, it's still, so there's a gap there somewhere, that somewhere in the civil service, um, somebody's being told not to respond to you guys. Is that fair? It would seem so. I yeah. think that's fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right from the very beginning there, uh, uh, from the first public meetings, 99% uh, uh, of the people were against it. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, it still slid through very easily. Hmm. And, and, and you guys have also mentioned too, this process seemed to go pretty quickly. It did, it did. Um, Five years ago. A, a good example was the construction of the access road. And um, uh, it was uh, started on April 15th, 2009, when Myra uh, applied for uh, crossing of the uh, National Access Stream. Hmm. Um, so on April the 13th, 2012, DOT sent their inspector out to see if he could get uh, an access on um, the curves in the Royal Road. Um, this uh, came back, uh, he investigated it, and he could not find an access point that wouldn't be hampered by uh, the southbound lane on the curves of the road. Uh, so he, he denied access for it. Um, so the next time they wrote, uh, they, uh, it was in 2014 in June, and they had uh, a private contractor doing some work at the, on the bridge site and on the access road, and he approved it right away. So um, uh, the different people in the DOT uh, went along with him. Uh, they used his figures um, until um, uh, the quarry permit was in September, was the access road was, was confirmed, was permitted. And in November, the quarry permit was approved. So uh, with questions uh, about this from uh, the people, the residents, myself and other people, um, questioned the access, how could they uh, uh, get an access that easy when the inspector from DOT uh, tried very hard to get uh, an access and he couldn't. So uh, in, uh, in June 2015 they, they came out after uh, we had called and uh, told them that the access was, access was wrong and uh, they came out and uh, they failed it. DOT failed it. Mm -hmm. uh, just because uh, mm -hmm. we had put pressure on them um, one of the ladies in DOT uh, was saying that the, uh, the heat is on us now. Uh, this means that we could potentially change the access. So then uh, they come out and did a bunch, uh, did a radar check and, and looked at the access again, and then they approved it again. So uh, they were sure that they were going to get an access at one point, uh, even though it was denied by their inspector. In the beginning, so that's how things get eased through. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, you're just left wondering, how did that happen? Which would be almost near impossible to dig back enough to 
That's find right. out how that kind of decision no, was made. We, we actually have done extensive research and we actually know the story. Sure. The EIA waiver was given to this guy on the basis of a complete misrepresentation on his part. He basically said that he was going to build a gravel pit using parcels of land with existing access roads. That was the basis upon which he was given his environmental impact assessment waiver in 2009. When it changed, the parcels changed, the access changed, everything changed. There was no EIA. The other quarries in the area have both had to submit to an environmental impact assessment. This guy never had to. Nobody's gone back and looked at the fact that he completely misrepresented what he was going to do in 2009. Nobody's ever looked back at the meeting in 2014 that we were at, the public hearing, to look at how he misrepresented again mm. what he was planning to do in our area. Mm. It was going to be a gravel pit. He was going to do it environmentally soundly, et cetera, et cetera. And we sat there. He didn't have a business plan. It was just, he, it looked like a clown show. Nobody was convinced by this guy. And we all left that meeting in April, Jerry and I thinking this is not going anywhere. He couldn't answer any of our questions. Mm. The meeting went for a couple of hours, and at the end of it, I asked for a show of hands who wants this particular gravel pit quarry in our, in our neighborhood. Nobody did. Nobody raised a hand except this guy and his lawyer. Mm. How's that for uh, community support? So anyway, every way, uh, I mean, for me, the key question that I'd like you to focus on if I can find it here, is this one. Well, and that's looking at, this is a, a copy of the rezoning application mm -hmm. uh, by the company, and here's what he says he's going to propose land use, office, ready mix, a shop, and gravel. Uh, nothing about quarry and rock. Nothing about uh, a major service industrial and construction. Story. That, that's the, and that's what got approved. That's, that's what it got approved. And yeah. that's not what's built. No, no. It was a strictly a rock board. <clears throat> and even here, here's a letter from uh, the city of Fredericton um, that uh, uh, Dallas Gillis wrote this here. Um, and it just says here, from a pl planning perspective, the operation of a land use activity that gains access to a provincially designated highway, a truck route, through a low density residential neighborhood is not appropriate. The negative impact of truck traffic on Claudie Road includes noise, dust, <coughs> and potentially conflict with residential traffic, including pedestrians. Hmm. Our opinion on this application would be the same if a gravel pit operation was located on Claudie Road within the city of Fredericton. And that's to do with him changing his mind, he couldn't get a, 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 a application for Claudie Road, and he changed it to the Royal Road. The Royal Road. And that's what the city said. Um, <coughs> that would it neg negatively impact either the residents of the city or the mun municipal infrastructure. Hmm. And that's um, that's. So, so it shifted from one side of the hill to the other side of the yeah. hill, basically, and, and basically and right in your backyard. Basically, yes. within a month. There was going to be a meeting to discuss it going down to the um, 105 in Douglas. And mm -hmm. all the people there, when they learned about that, they said, no way. So mysteriously, a month later, he's got approval to go the other yeah, way, the Royal, way. without any environmental impact assessment. We're talking about wood turtles. We're talking about residences. We're talking about water tables and wells and all sorts of things. Yeah. And very hard questions have been asked from the get-go here. Did but, you find your question that you were? Well, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to do a little um, for you and your audience, Dennis. Yes. Imagine, imagine a stage play where in Act One the emphasis is all on misrepresentation. In Act Two, sucking and blowing and or running and hiding is pretty much all that's on offer. In Act Three, Act One and Act Two themes are simply repeated in more and more discordant, victimizing forms. In Act 4, a choir, styling itself as the moving forwards, assumes center stage, the emphasis at this point being extending and pretending, extending the performance while pre pretending it has merits. This is what we've been putting up with. Aside from the dust, the noise, all of this kind of stuff, depreciation in the housing, mm. all of us are 
you know, that that's unfortunately what happens when something like this is put into yeah. a residential neighborhood. Your assessments go way down. Yeah. You so, guys have some stories about that, but Judith, you have something you want to... I was just going to say, by moving their access road from Douglas to the railroad, they greatly increased the significance of the environmental impact mm. because they're now crossing the Nashwaxa stream mm. in which we find the Atlantic salmon and the wood turtle. Yeah. No. Now, it would no doubt also get dust just from the operation, but nowhere near as much as it gets from all the debris dropping off yeah. the trucks as they cross over. So let's follow that a bit about the wood turtle and, and the watershed. <clears throat> so water is pretty fundamental and New Brunswick still struggles with having an overall water strategy. And that's how in part some of these things happen to you guys. And if there was better attention to water and its nurturing and its protection, um, this would help preclude what you've had to deal with. But a lot of people wouldn't know about the Nashwaxis watershed or the wood turtle or the impact. So they're forming in their head as they listen. Well, okay, there's a quarry and there's some turtles. So can you deepen that a little bit um, and tie it to uh, the fact that that watershed is connected to a much larger infrastructure that now has official recognition from, I believe it's the states in Canada. So, like it's a really important piece of our, of our land. <coughs> But well, people don't know its story. I would think almost everyone in New Brunswick knows about the Atlantic salmon, so we don't really need to talk about the salmon part, but they've yeah. been in that stream all of my life. Yeah. Um, the wood turtle, I believe, is recognized by both the Canadian government and the American government as an endangered species. And there are not that many good breeding grounds left. There are probably only three or four in New Brunswick. A critical habitat is just or is defined as a habitat where they find at least two adult turtles. And we find 70 to 80 at any given time in, in the area close to and around the quarry. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not finding very many juveniles anymore, so we don't know how much damage the last five years of noise, dust, runoff, and, <clears throat> and pollution of their water environment has resulted in potential decline of breeding and egg laying and mm -hmm. and the nurture of the little ones. And, and yeah. what's the agreement with the states or is it part of the St. John River Society network or you taught me earlier that it's part of something that sounds a pretty official. That's a different that's, agreement. That's, that's federal. That, that's the St. John River Valley, uh, the Basin, Basin Authority, which yeah. basically is, is, a, is a cross national. Mm -hmm agreement to preserve the St. John River and all of the water that, and the aquifer below it so that people, anything that is going to impact that, like a breach in a quarry, for example, into the aquifer is, is bad news for the water table and the St. John River. But as far as the turtles are concerned, there are only a thousand in New Brunswick. We found about 10% of them. Mm -hmm. This guy is continuing to do his business out of compliance with regulations about how to protect these things. The federal government of this country is very clear. If you find these things, there are things that you should not be doing mm -hmm. to endanger their critical habitat. Mm -hmm. One is construction of road infrastructure, deforestation and forest alteration um, going on here, complete or partial drainage or filling of wetlands, shoreline and stream bed alteration. Well, Myra is doing all of those things. And we're talking about, there's only 6,000 wood turtles in this country. Mm. Now, if you'll allow me, we commenced our inventory of wood turtles and butternut trees in our impacted area when it became clear it would be up to our community to rise to this occasion. We proceeded to unearth one of the richest remnant populations of them in the Maritimes. We disclosed our findings, all GPS, to people at the Department of Environment. We received no way to go, good jobs from anyone there. You're asking us how you build a, a better economy. Well, I did put up a YouTube video called Estes Bridge Quarry, Where Do You Begin? And I would welcome your your viewing audience. And you can use we'll some of it. that splicing too because I answer that question in a variety of ways there. Yeah. No due diligence was done here at all. According to somebody in the federal government who we've talked to, even the causeway that they built across the field there should have 
triggered an environmental impact assessment. <coughs> Even after he got his waiver on the basis of a misrepresentation in 2009, when he decided to put that Bailey Bridge over the stream and then build the causeway over to Royal Road, that should have triggered an environmental impact assessment and that would have shut him down immediately. Mm. All we're asking as a community amongst, there are two or three things who we were asking the government to do, is do an environmental impact assessment on this guy. He's out of compliance. The wood turtles are suffering. I walked from, I, I walked most of the NASA, NASA stream this particular year. I only found one juvenile turtle, wood turtle. Hmm. And they don't do well with dust. They don't do well with turgid streams. All of the runoff from this thing in the winter time scours where they nest and hibernate. Hmm. It destroys them. It kills them. It crushes them in blocks of ice. Jerry has pictures of what they are filling the stream with all through the winter. Salt and dirt. <coughs> this it's, is not good news for wood turtles. No, it's dropping in from a Bailey Bridge, which is open. They plow all the snow, which includes uh, whatever, salt, dirt, grease, oil, into the stream. And we've documented that. Um, so, And the government is saying that they didn't have to do an EIA study. Uh, because they didn't know the turtles that were there. Well, in 2013, the government put out a report on endangers or species at risk in New Brunswick, and the turtles are on there. Hmm. Butternut trees, wood turtle, barn swallows, common nighthawk, and the bittern are all in that stream, and they're all endangered. So they really didn't do a job checking the wetland. I think that's just a result of what we don't know, we don't have to deal with. Do you want, can I ask you a question, Dennis, to mm. your audience as well? Okay. How do you set up a conversation between those who make poor decisions and those who are the victims of those poor decisions in a way that advantages those who make the poor decisions? Mm. That is the mindset that we've been dealing with for five years. They know that they did wrong here. And behind the scenes, they will confess that. It's the royal mess on Royal Road. So what do they do? They try to think of ways to silence people like us. And they are effectively doing that right now in advance of this November extend and pretend um, approval to operate for this Myra company. The questions are voluminous that have been asked, and they have not answered hardly any of them. They don't know how to answer them, so their philosophy, more or less, in 2015, it was basically, let's not engage with these people. Or if we have a meeting with them, we'll only invite one person. So it becomes the classic he said, she said. Many times Jerry and I wanted to go to one of these meetings with somebody from the Regional Service Commission, but they would only allow one of us to go. And sometimes they would blurt out shameful things about this quarry. It was a done deal before our public hearing. Mm -hmm. But if it's only one person witnessing all of this, it's very difficult for that one person to go out and say, my goodness, they confessed that they didn't do due diligence on this, that they actually didn't care that they didn't do due, due diligence on this Myra quarry. So on the one hand, we have this guy who wants to put his quarry there. He's had trouble in Burt's Corner. He was shut down there. He misrepresents what he wants to do in Douglas and Estes Bridge. On the other hand, we have rules and regulations in our local service districts. And, and apparently they aren't worth the paper that they're written on because if you read them, they are very strong with respect to what they're going to what they're going to protect and how they're going to protect the people who move to them. And then one day you wake up and you realize you have no protections in the local service district whatsoever. If it says that you can only have things happen in your residential community that are compatible with your residential community, you find out thanks to what happened to us. No, anything goes here. 
That's the way it is in New Brunswick. That's how we build better economies. We completely ignore the voice of the people. We completely ignore the health impacts of what we're doing. We completely ignore the environmental impacts of what we're doing. Way to go. Is that, uh, is that how you out there want to build your economy? I mean, if things like this happen to you, I think that's a relevant question here. Mm. But unfortunately, we're still dealing with those mindsets where the people that we've been meeting with this particular year I think every time we sit at the table with them, they're just trying to think of how they can build the narrative in a way that advantages the ones that have made the poor decisions over the ones that are the victims of it. Uh, so wait, I'm going to go to Judith. Okay. 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 Judith. okay, I think we've talked about like the economy of, of jobs in our area. Hmm. <clears throat> and I know we have, I know Jerry has letters from the city about how appreciative they are of all this cheap rock they now have and the transportation so much cheaper so it's so close and it's all good but what i don't think that people realize and what's spread out in front of me is the impact statements from the people who live in our area mm. and 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 they're the people who are paying for the cheap rock that everybody else is enjoying and these letters are full of comments about damage to their homes from blasting and and they're full of loss of an enjoyment of their property because for 12 to 13 hours a day they can't be outdoors because of the dust and then a few more hours because they have to go out and clean up everything every day so that they can sit on their patio and then there's the loss of of the value of their property as people are probably who live in the immediate area the 30 or 40 families in the valley would probably be fortunate if they could get 50 cents on the dollar for the for the value of their homes so many of these people here talk to me about feeling trapped. They're older people. Their house was part of their retirement package, and now it's worth, worth much less, mm. even if anyone wanted to buy it. Um, so there's a lot of desperation going on in here. So And there's all that stress that Jerry, that Jerry talked about earlier. So their health is, is deteriorating. And they're paying a huge price for this cheap rock that the city of Fredericton celebrates every single day. Mm. No doubt the provincial government too. And you there's not a fairness in that. Really. No, and you touched on a key point because a lot of people live out that way because they want to live out in the country, and it's their home. They've been there for a long time, and so they've had green space and quiet and, and all that. And then now it's all the trucks. So there's the value of the home. But then there's the intangible of living there and the quality of life that's there. And that's all gone, too. One lady says, now our home is practically worthless in value. Uh, and the remainder of our lives are ruined. And she's 76 years old. Yeah. That's powerful. Sad. Sad. It's true. And I have many more of those. Just to uh, talk about taxes while Judas on there, I have two um, tax uh, taxes from 2012. Uh, one house was uh, value assessment was 184,000. Uh, when they uh, they came to do their assessment in 2016, after the second year of the quarry, it was down to 128. Um, here's another <coughs> from 2012. Uh, these are all on the uh, the flats on the rural road. 158,000 down to 103 in 16. That's and that's um, by the government itself. Hmm. That's grand theft robbery. Yep. And we have brought that to their attention. But again, we're dealing with the mindset that um, how do we um, finesse this? How do we uh, not answer these people's questions or concerns? Um, I would um, like to propose that a process with integrity prioritizes questions and concerns like these. It does not leave them hanging. Unfortunately, that's been our experience for five years. The insult of the quarry, the injury of the way that the government has been uh, stonewalling us, trying to keep us at arm's length from sitting down with them in meetings. And then when we go to meetings, we find that the minutes of those meetings do not reflect the content of what was discussed at the <coughs> meetings. I find that extremely disturbing. I have been at many of these meetings. I have done right to information requests to see what followed from those particular meetings. 
I have found that contentious talking points are presented as consensus items after the fact by the people that were steering these meetings. I find that offensive and troubling, and I don't think that's a good way to build economies in New Brunswick. We have had meetings where only one person in 2019 has been invited from our community. They don't want more than one person. Why? It's kind of interesting because they have like seven or eight of them from the Department of Environment, mm -hmm. and they only want one of us. And they think, I guess, that they might be able to intimidate that one person in the room. Mm -hmm. And that person, fortunately, who's in the room is not intimidated. And they'll make statements that the dust is getting better or something, and then that one person will come and show them photographs taken the day before. No, actually, you're wrong. You're wrong about this and you're wrong about that. Mm -hmm. There will be people in these particular <coughs> rooms who will say that ludicrously that maybe the answer for the quarry and the residents is to plant some trees around the quarry. That's ludicrous because the trees will just die from the dust. They don't want this kind of stuff to get out there, though. They want that one person in the room where no minutes are taken mm. to just be flabbergasted that this is their solution going forward into five more years of this guy's permit to operate in a critical species habitat mm -hmm. right above residences. Blasting over his limit at least twice that we can find in the records mm -hmm. without getting any fines. He always gets mulligans for what he does. And what are we supposed to do in this province? Are we moving forward with this kind of stuff? happening around us, I hope that this doesn't happen to the people in Hammond River who are fighting a quarry there that's about to possibly get green lighted. Mm -hmm. They're doing everything that they can to stop it. And they feel like they're getting the runaround from what I'm picking up from them. If you're going to do something like this to people, the price of doing that kind of business, I believe, is you give the people 300% of their housing, their, their houses assessment. If you're going to destroy their quality of life, if you're going to rob them of their assessment value, I think an honest businessman who really cared about his reputation would just basically say, I think that if I have integrity, I really need to give these people 300% of what their house is worth. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't want to accept that, that's their problem. But we have cases of this all through the country where there is a going rate, give it to people. But in this case, this shouldn't have been here at all because of the critical species habitat and the complete and utter lack of due diligence that went into putting this quarry above people's homes in the first place. Think Nat, that what you say about reasonable remuneration for your property is a good point, but none of that helps the critical species in the critical habitat they are in. And, and so not living directly there, I can empathize with the people who do, but I have to focus on the bigger picture too. I mean, the environment is the, is, is the issue and the department that is looking after this is the Department of Environment yeah. or not. And they could and absolutely. It's about water, you know. It's ultimately it's yeah. about water. Well, you, and we were talking about that earlier, mm -hmm. and and it's sad to say, but in that international agreement that Canada and New Brunswick and the state of Maine and possibly the province of Quebec signed on to, the only one who's really done anything to protect the river is the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. I'd like to read a paragraph uh, pertaining to all this here. It's uh, it's from. Uh, the Honorable Serge Roussel, who was Environment Minister for the Liberal government, uh, which would not speak to us at all for the four years they were in power. Um, taking uh, that into consideration after review by department staff and myself, a number of concerns and uncertainties have arisen concerning cumulative effects on both the physical and social environment in, in the area proposed for quarry operation. These includes, but are not limited to, the cumulative effects 
of increased dust, noise, and traffic in an area already subject to these effects, potential impacts on well water, groundwater, and water runoff, potential structural impacts to properties in the area, potential environmental impacts including loss of forests, wetlands, and impacts to water courses, impacts on wood turtle habitat, a threatened species on both the New Brunswick and Government of Canada species at risk, undetermined impacts to several species at risk, birds in the area, including the common nighthawk and bank swallow. And that's from Serge Roussel. When, as, uh, as I listen to all the pieces, New Brunswick starts to sound a little bit like the Wild West. It's like an outlaw state or an outlaw province. It's like we can have all this paper, we can have all these people active, but it still seems like there's an unruliness to it that creates moments like this. Um, and then there's other examples around the province, but I'm, tr I'm trying to get at the heart of something. So there's this massive details in research and documentation. There's this dysfunction in the gaps between government, within government, and in government to public. <clears throat> but off on the side, it still feels like over in the shadows, there's something else at play where the real heart of it is, because well, you guys have had to talk all around it, and you can't get at exactly who's making the decision that's making this happen in the first place, that's putting you into that reactionary position. Because well, you're always reacting. You're not ahead of the curve. You're reacting after the decisions are made. I, I don't you think know. I don't think we're we're dancing around it. In our pre meet, Dennis, I gave you a letter that I sent to the Minister of Environment. I also gave you some questions that haven't been answered, even though they were tabled with Blaine Higgs on second May twenty nineteen. Yeah. I, 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 I sorry, I only meant dancing around in the sense that you can't get at the heart of who made who made the grunt decision in the first place that because put, they don't put want this. it brought out. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be the all word government. Yeah. The all word government started. And Higgs so was in that government, yeah. and you know, okay. but the Liberals didn't want to talk about it either. Yeah, no. so there's this other, yeah. and that's why I started with the business versus the environment or people kind of thing, because New Brunswick struggles with that narrative. It's like business first, however you want to define business, right. and there's a full range of, yeah. of things. I'm not generalizing too much, but there's this belief that this is the way we have to do things to make things better, which is why that economy question, you want to build a better economy, but well, it doesn't work. Well, it's it doesn't so work not, for, not for twelve people. <clears throat> the, the, yeah. For twelve well, people, ruin the economy and the and, and the, the environment, uh, environment of a beautiful valley. And and break uh, break agreements and you know. This this whole thing ran roughshod over people's rights. It ran roughshod over rules and regulations for local service districts. It ran roughshod over environmental impacts, health impacts. You know. I was I walked over to the thing that uh, Le Col Saint Anne did on Friday. All the seven hundred kids out there in front of the legislative assembly building, with their signs, and I tried to visualize. I, I actually walked by Blaine Higgs and West McLean on my way there. They were they were talking to Charles LeBlanc. They didn't see me, but I walked right by them. They were there when those girls and those boys were talking about their future. 100 years from now or 70 years from now or 50 years from now what what kind of a planet are they going to be left hmm. anyway i went over there and i just started to try to imagine what blaine higgs who was actually just a block away if he had come over if he had actually taken the time to come over to speak to these kids what would he say to them hmm. and then i started this thought experiment the deputy minister of environment what would she or he say to these children. I couldn't even picture those two people coming over and addressing these people because the Department of Environment, it, it shouldn't be called that at all. I don't think that there are many people at the top of that department that really care about the environment at all. So we're not dancing around your question. I think that the contempt with which we've been Treated. faced when we bring up the turtles, when we bring up the water tables, hmm. I think it's staring you right in the face very loudly that these kinds of considerations do not matter to people who have been in power for quite a long time, not necessarily the premiership, yep. but we're talking about the second and third echelons of power here. I think the decision yeah. on the Myra Quarry was made before the first public meeting, mm -hmm. period. It was. Yeah. And I think we know that from some of the documentation. 
And so it wouldn't have mattered how many people went to the meeting and how many people said no. The decision was already made, and, and I think that the, they kind of took a look at Royal Road and said, country bumpkins, they're not going to say anything, and so we're just going to ride it right out through there. And that was pretty much it. And that was actually said by the director, the Regional Service Commission. Mm -hmm. People on the Royal, Royal Road won't matter to them. Well, mm -hmm. I, I'll let you know how it matters to this little lady. She says, there was a time I loved living here. This is my home. Now I think about moving every day. However, I feel very trapped because who in their right mind would buy a house with a quarry in the backyard? It's such a depressing situation. The worst thing about this is that at the public meeting, we asked a lot of questions. I personally took my questions to the Regional Service Commission and the Department of Environment the very next day because I smelled something very fishy going on. And I had my requests for answers to my question date stamped. Mm -hmm. I never heard back from these parties. We didn't hear anything for four months. They approved it in July of 2014, and the residents were not informed until September 2014. And in the middle of this, a poor woman bought a house in August 2014, right across from where the haul out road comes out, because she did not know that she was about to buy something right where the trucks are roaring right into her little house. I was the first person to tell her what was about to happen with a petition. She asked what was happening to the field over there. And I looked at her and I said, don't you know, she had just bought her first house. She was from Stanley. She wanted to move closer. And I was the one, not the government, not Myra. I was the one, a citizen who, is, who, who, who sits here with you with five years worth of hard questions that have never been answered by successive governments mm -hmm. and successive regimes at the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. Is this how you build a better economy? I think it's a resounding no, mm -hmm. no, no. Do you guys feel this is a <clears throat> form of corruption or just mismanagement? It, I know that's a tougher question, but you're living it. You're right in the thick of it, and you've done all of the work, more than all of the work. <clears throat> and past guests have been on talking about processes, trying to improve processes, <clears throat> and New Brunswick doesn't seem to go into the deep end sometimes. We'll get national stories about corruption out of Montreal and the sponsorship scandal or the corruption around the hospital in SNC-Lavalin. We'll get stories from other places, but you never get any out of New Brunswick. It's like we're afraid to use the word. But but some of this stuff just doesn't sound right, doesn't want to add up properly. And thank heavens for you guys doing all that work, because without that tension, you would never get that sense that that's what percolating in the background. There's the pipeline discussion going on. There's fracking discussions going on. There's cis and mine discussion going on. They all have the same characteristics, but different details. They all seem to have the same process, but different details. <clears throat> So, did, you know, did it ever cross your mind that this is corrupt or this is crooked or there's something not right here? Does With, all without time. putting it you in the box, the you know? Yeah. You know <clears throat> we, we know generally how this started. It, it was either favoritism or uh, a donation. And, um, and therefore, um, it's done. The people don't have a say in it. It goes right through. And we've showed you many, many things that have been eased through. I've talked to public... Uh, employees that have retired uh, on this here and they said it was eased through they cut corners for it so h how would you think otherwise and and which then begs unless you guys want to speak to that too because it begs how do we fix it or how do we address it because you've got that important renewal window coming up i personally have no proof that they did anything wrong but i find it odd that they never want to talk to me I don't want to talk about the process. They don't want to talk about the way things are now. They don't want to talk about a solution. They don't want to talk about the health issues because they don't know about them, because they don't want to. Yeah. Um, they're just hoping we all go away or die or something. And some of these people will die yeah. soon yeah. because they're old. 
Yeah. Some people had to move away because of their health issues. Yeah. Okay. One poor fellow had to sell his house in 2015 because his wife was this, on. This is his letter right, right here. here. Yeah. Yeah. She had breathing problems. They had to clean her breathing machine on a daily basis. They had to sell their house for 50000 less than it was assessed for or something like that in 2015. Mm. I mean, do, you, do you want to read that letter? It's, it was quite brief, so yeah. <clears throat> if you think it's appropriate. you know. I was asked why I was selling out on the Royal Road. I work nights, and the increase in truck traffic doesn't allow me much rest. Can't enjoy outside my deck because of dust from the quarry, which I am told is toxic. My wife has medical problems and the dust doesn't help. With the increase in truck traffic, it's just a matter of time before someone gets hit going out their driveway. And that was 2015. Yeah. And only a, less than a year in operation. You know, there's another letter from a, a gentleman who lives on the Kingsley Road. And then they never drive on the Royal Road because his wife can't tolerate the dust. So they do the McLeod Hill detour every single time they go to the city. Because if she enters the area where the quarry is, she coughs uncontrollably. And maybe to help the audience understand the dust element, um, we'll use some of the clip that you put up on YouTube because you can see the dust fanning through. <clears throat> but when I look at it, it's like China. When we see pictures of Singapore and stuff, and there's this fog, or L.A. used to look like that. You just There's no clear air anywhere. Everything has that haze. And then the way it sits on top of things. I think you guys have shared stories about you could write messages to each other oh. on, you know. <laughs> I think the Lung Association is pretty concerned because it's such fine particulate dust mm -hmm. and initially when the government said they were going to test for it they tried but their equipment wouldn't me measure fine particulate can, can matter. go up that high. Eh? That low I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. So you know it Martin. just goes on and on like and okay so we tried and we didn't find anything, and so we don't really know, so we can't really say it's harmful. So, so and isn't it fascinating in the absence of that knowledge? So if the government position is, well, we didn't know, so they can still make the decision to move forward. You yes. would think you would need to know before you make a decision to move forward, rather than we don't know, but we're still going to well, move forward. Well, they didn't know anything about the business, and they went forward, right? They yeah. didn't know it was a rock quarry. They thought it was a sand pit, and they didn't know about the environment, although everybody who lives there knows. And they didn't know about the health issues, and they still don't, you know, six years by six years later. So here we are. Yeah. Uh, and these will be long-term deaths, right? They're not going to die tomorrow, yeah. but they're going to die sooner than they should have if, if indeed it is toxic dust. And it's going to exacerbate other people's health issues no matter what they are. So. And here's the icing on the cake for the company. They know when the monitoring is happening. Mm. They make... Adjustments. Adjust. This has been going on since the get-go. In, the begin in the beginning, we were told that if we had complaints about the dust, that we were supposed to take our complaints to Myra, not to the Department of Environment. I had a lady on my lawn telling me that if I had any issues, and this lady was from the Department of Environment, I should take them to the company that was polluting my valley. They didn't care. This was what was checking and balancing the Myra company in 2014 and 2015. But now, when they do their monitoring, Myra knows when they're doing the monitoring. It's only, it's only seven days a year. They know exactly which days they're doing the air quality monitoring, and they make adjustments. And so when you see pictures of what looks like China, chances are that's not the day <laughs> that they're doing the monitoring. I shouldn't laugh, but it's... It's funny. The government yeah. makes Myra pay for the testing, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, which might be good business for the government. But guess who gets the results? Yeah. Myra. Yeah. So and we don't get them. Yeah. I, I assume the government gets them, but we don't get them. I take pictures probably three, four times a week. Uh, um, when the road dries out, that's when we have the problems. They, they track all the... Uh, uh, the residue from uh, the rock down in the tires and rocks fly off the trucks and break windows and, and damage cars. Mm -hmm. But I take pictures three or four times a week to show them the dust in front of the house very clearly. Mm -hmm. And I send them off and I don't get any replies. I always do that. And uh, 
there is no reply to it. Can I say something cheeky to you, Dennis? Go for it. You ask how this is helping the economy. If you do write to information requests like a lot of us have done in the Valley, you find out a lot about the make work that our right to information requests actually do. There's a lot of people involved in trying to find files and blah, blah, blah. Yes. And there's all sorts of emails going back and forth to Joe Blow here and Jane Blow over there. And it's almost amazing to see the email chains. And it's, it's created great work. Yes. These, these right to information requests are the thing that's actually creating a lot of very good, well-paying uh, employment in this province. And that's, that's really sad because those of us who actually do the right to information requests have found with respect to checks and balances in this province, going back to your question about how corrupt it is, well, mm. test the checks and the balance mechanisms of your province to find out if they actually work. Right to information requests bearing on the matter under consideration here are handled in ways that both, quote, puzzle a province's right to information commission and are deemed by her to, quote, fail that requester. I've gotten this from the right to information office more times than I care to, to tell you. The province's integrity commissioner can offer no meaningful mechanism for checking or balancing the privileging of or the privileging of falsification over evidence and inquiry that has caused the province's right to information commissioner puzzlement. I think right there, it I know it sounds complicated at a certain level, but what underpins all this? There are no checks and balances when it comes to all this. I have written letters to Charles Murray. I actually had a relationship with Charles Murray for a while. And I wrote him letters, but he he would hem and he would haw and he'd say, you know, I am the government's advocate. I'm not really your advocate. I am the government's advocate. I'm always trying to figure out a way that I can justify some foolishness of this government over anything that might be happening to you. He'll never say this to you on camera, but I have back and forths with him where this is what he's doing. He's not going to try to get answers for any of our questions. That's not his role. What is his role? Well, that's different from my he, interview with him. He's you know? a, he, but he's a check. He's a nice guy yeah. from the Kingston yeah. Peninsula. He's a good checker and he's a good balancer. Yeah. You would think, but you realize you've taken an issue where you're experiencing a nightmare to him and you get nowhere. You don't get answers to your questions. You don't get any kind of a report. And he actually told me, what am I supposed to do? I complained about the Nashwalk River watershed once, and where did that get me? It didn't help those people. You think I'm going to help you by, you know, well, so geez, it, Charles, if you can't get anywhere in this province, what does that, is this the Charbonneau so, Commission? So here? there, good. Yeah, because that's where I was going to lead it, you know. So if he gets st stuck as that advocate third party on the outside, or if Anne Bertrand gets stuck, and advocate on third party. It, that's what I meant about talking around it. It's really hard to get at something because you can have this piece in place. So you guys can't get anywhere. Uh, um, Charles Murray can't get anywhere. And Bertrand can't get anywhere. Um, and yet decisions are still being made. So, so you can kind of talk all around it to create a picture, which is why I asked the corruption question, which is a tougher question because when yes. you say stuff like that, you got to document it. But the hole in the middle is where the documentation is, and we can't find it. Meanwhile, you're living with real-life consequences in real time, and decisions are happening, and there's still that vacuum at the center of, of how that happened in the first place, because it's there where your ability to stop the renewal will exist. You know, I'm six foot tall. You used to be 6'4", oh. right, before all no, this? No, no, no. <laughs> A healthy weight for somebody my height, Dennis, is 165 pounds. Mm. During my time on the road, I went down to 135. I would wake up at 2 in the morning on a daily basis with night sweats and palpitations. I keep trying to get Jerry out because I have not had night sweats or heart palpitations ever since I left that area. And I, I feel good I again. Sleep at night. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I want away from this here because I know my wife and myself uh, it, it's probably going to harm us, and, uh, yeah. and it, how do I do that? Some of it reminds me of <clears throat> when military or um, other police agencies, when there's someone doing a hostage situation, they'll blast them with music, for, mm. blast them with noise mm. for 
days and days on end because when you become sleep depri deprived, all the other stuff breaks down pretty quick, which is what you've described in some of the health assessments. One other aspect to corruption, mm -hmm. and I don't know whether you can classify it as corru corruption, is uh, residents that live in this zone that work for the government have been threatened uh, maybe to lose their job or maybe they get um, bad jobs from there, there on. Uh, one minister even told one of the employees from the Liberal government to stay out of this. Hmm. So is that corruption? All of this over 12 jobs and all of yeah. this over a yeah. quarry <clears throat> that didn't create any more volume in rock. It just reallocated volume. And, and, also, and okay. well, it brought it closer to the city, so it's cheaper. So right? that's the upside. Yeah. That's, that's and a guy who misrepresented what he was going to do for his environmental impact waiver, on and on and on. I would like to just basically share with your 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 viewing audience some of the questions that have never been answered. Hmm. I'm only gonna. I'm, it's only like five. There's like a whole list of them, and you've received some more of them. But I'm just yeah. gonna read them so that people know what we're kind of talking about here. Why was Myra's dirty, noisy, dust spewing quarry sited in a narrow valley prone to thermal inversions directly above long-standing, well-dependent residences and prime critical species habitat? Why was this done to the people in this narrow valley without their full and informed consent? Why were fair and reasonable questions these people asked the very moment they were made aware of this development not addressed by civil servants overseeing the file? Where at all did assistant Deputy Minister Perry Haynes in his June 2014 email exchanges with then Minister of Environment Danny Soucy emphasized this residential community's pointed questions, concerns, and overwhelming lack of buy-in. Why does the government cut and run from the myriad tough questions regarding this quarry? How, for example, do slight rewrites to Myra's current approval to operate address long-standing questions of the type, quote, what sort of epidemiology condones the siting of industrial quarries directly upwind from long-standing residential areas? Just a, a side note crossed my mind when you mentioned Myra's name a couple of times. Are they a New Brunswick company? Or are yes. they a company from somewhere they're, else? They're from New Brunswick. <clears throat> okay. um, their backers aren't all from New Brunswick. Some mm. from Nova Scotia, mm. from some different parts of New Brunswick. Okay. The underlying theme to almost all of this is a sense of justice like the <clears throat> the triggers on your nervous system are partly environmental and partly emotional because of you keep doing this work to get some recognition or some sort of communication and you keep getting blanks or silence or dead air or whatever you know procrastination so emotionally the wear and tear is just crazy and the heart of that is that sense of justice a relationship where you're working with your government and your community to try to have a flow like an energy back and forth and instead you get these blanks and you got to live with the consequences uh, of that space. So. I actually think the government is hoping that we grow old and tired mm -hmm. and fall back from doing this. But like Judith mentioned that doesn't help the environment much at all because doesn't, that's no. a hundred year, two hundred year window, been, not a five, ten year window. We've been assured that the quarry has at least 25 more years of life. You've been told that already. Yes. Yeah. And there's a 1999 study says that if we lose three adult turtles out of 100 individuals that we know about, hmm. they will be extinct in 50 years. Hmm. So, so we'll be halfway there when the quarry gets finished. So isn't that a powerful shift in thinking? And it, I want the audience to appreciate it. It's not about wood turtles. It is about water. And it's not about um, houses. It's about the process for how this is decided. Or what kind of world do you want to live in? Or what kind of economy you want to create? Those are the details that ground the conversation. Somebody needs to stand up and say they made a mistake. Hmm. I brought on, a all, on all of the issues, it's just the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And, and doesn't that sound like some other places we can think of in the province? Sure. Well, you can, you can go all over the place. I've been linked up with people all over the province who are dealing with the same kind of regional service commission nonsense that we did. I would like to emphasize, though, Dennis, that we haven't talked about the media here in this whole conversation. The media has basically tried to box the story as just a, a poor victim story. Well, that's why I brought up, you know, because the typical media narrative would be <clears throat> gravel trucks, business, industry, good for economy, and a picture of a turtle going through a stream. Well, not even the turtle and, and going through a stream. And it's not 
the de that's some of the detail, but it's not the heart of the story. The, the, the CBC and all of the other outlets, the mainstream outlets, will not talk to the people who are victimizing us. Or at best, they will leave a message on the machine. Nobody got back to us, so that's the punchline of our story. We talked to this poor victim, we talked to that poor victim. But what about the victimizers? There's no accountability from the media. The reason why, I mean, you don't build a good economy when you don't have that kind of conversation flowing back and forth. Why can't some of these people be forced to answer some of these questions on some of these programs, like the Terry Sege show in the morning, for example? We never hear about the story. There is somewhere a decision made that has nothing to do with how the Myra got put there in the first place, but it's a different level of unaccountability that we need to confront in this province if we're going to build better economies. It would be very productive if some of the people who victimized us were sitting around this table with us. Mm -hmm. They are not here. Mm -hmm. That is a big problem. We are not the story, but the media likes to make us the story when we were not doing anything. We were living and let live, and then all of a sudden some victim miser comes into our little part of New Brunswick, and then all of a sudden we're the story, but they're not the story. Mm -hmm. This is really a huge obstacle yep. to making this economy better in this province. Well, obviously some of our media gets their financing from government. And some of our media gets its financing from big business. And so I'm sure they're nudged to take their stories. <laughs> you in don't a, need to be polite. <laughs> to, in a certain direction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, that, that's another one in New Brunswick's main narratives is that mm -hmm. we don't have transparency, accountability, or we don't dive in the deep end very much um, with the intent of a good heart and with the intent of finding the best solution as opposed to doing the expose and making someone look bad. That needs to turn, that conflict-based media work of us and them and that, no, no, it needs to be a different, a third question, like a cooperative model or complementary model, because everyone does want the province to do well. But somewhere along the way, it's, all this conflict narrative has to go away and get into, yes, so it wouldn't it be fun if there were three or four here that you know that you've got on paper there to talk about this, but they would have to be accountable. They would have to be transparent and they'd have to speak with an honest heart. You know, it's like this, and then you'd have the breakthrough for the con economy you could actually create here. Well, I have no, mm. I have no reservations in this room on this program to say that the emperor has no clothes at the Department of Environment. Mm. Absolutely no clothes mm. with respect to this particular file. Mm. Up and down. Mm. But I, I think that the blame really is at the head I don't think that the people who are down really are people to blame. Up to a certain point, when I was a little child, I was given this book. And it's I called think The Oxbow Incident. The Oxbow Incident. And I think it's a wonderful allegory about bystanding in the face of wrongdoing. Yes. And I would encourage people to see what we're going through yeah. as something akin to this when you're talking about the Charles Murrays and you're talking about the media. Because there's a lot of bystanding going on with this, and nobody's saying, let's stop this. Let's hope somebody else does something about this. Mm -hmm. And we're, again, paying the price of that as people who have to go on your show and basically try get to get some there. accountability, not only from Blaine Higgs and Jeff Carr, but from the CBC and from some of the other mainstream outlets like CTV. Mm -hmm. All of these are different programs for you if you want to go there. It's funny, when uh, Blaine Higgs was opposition leader, we had a meeting and Judith was there and he, uh, he listened to our story and he said he would help us. That was how long ago? Thing. That was, how long uh, ago was that? That before was the a couple of years before the election. Years back. Yeah. Well, yeah. a couple of months before the election, yeah. so yeah. not that far. Yeah. And yeah. since then? Since then. Since then, um, uh, maybe. meetings have worth, you know, meetings that nothing happened. I don't know. He, he may be, think yeah. he's helping us, but we haven't seen it yet. Mm. We haven't seen the the help. Maybe he is. I can't say he's not. Yeah. Uh, he's, I uh, mean, you know, we talked about earlier about, you know, maybe the government should just buy out all the people in the valley, right? And and that 
that's okay. But maybe they should just buy out the quarry and close it, and then we'd save the environment and we'd keep the people. Yeah. Yep. Well, and that gets into how do those priorities get decided? And well, they yeah. keep telling mm -hmm. us that they can't close the quarry because it will he'll sue them. Well, my counterpoint to that is he misrepresented what he was going to do there from the get-go, yeah. possibly with your complicity. He doesn't have a leg to stand on because he went into that room in 2009 and he was the one who said, I'm only going to put a gravel pit off the cloudy road using existing driveways. That's all I'm going to do. And it sort of just mushroomed, exploded out of total proportion to include different parcels of land, a stream, there are other areas. species. Fairly close to the city was rock. It's not that we don't need rock. We all need rock if we're going to build a house or a roadway yeah. or a driveway or whatever it is. We so, all need that, but we don't need to get it in somebody's backyard. For example, if nobody had lived there and they over the quarry and somebody built a house there and they came to me and they said, I can't stand the noise and the dust, I'd say, but the quarry was there. Yeah. It, yeah. It's your problem. But that's not the way this works. No. Some of those homes are over 100 years old. Yep. And it's not, they're not surprises. And the environmental element to it, too. It, that also begs the question, does New Brunswick have a land use policy in general where they know this sort of work can apply in this area and this sort of work applies in this area? Yeah. I don't think we have an overall if land use policy. If you live in rural New Brunswick, beware. There are no protections, no protections for you yeah. that are worth yeah. the paper that they're written on. Mm -hmm. I don't care where you live in rural New Brunswick. You can sit down and you can do your community planning mm. for years, and it's probably a crackerjack community plan. And I think Estes Bridge did that beginning in the 1980s, and they, it's a wonderful document. I read it, and I thought, I'm protected here. Mm. I wasn't protected at all. I thought that I could live looking at yep. beauty. But yeah. the other part of that, too, is that a lot of the province is, is, has crown land interspersed with private land in, in rural areas, and we have no say in what happens on crown land like mm. zero mm. even if it's right in the middle of your rural community or in your local service district zero wouldn't it be nice if you did have a say in wouldn't crown it? land because mm. the logic is it's it crown land yeah, yeah. it kind of belongs, belongs to, to all of us yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. it's um, an 18th century thought <laughs> <laughs> um let's take a couple of minutes and wrap this up a little bit what what didn't we touch on safety uh, the highway there, mm. that's Route 620, mm -hmm. is a very windy road. Mm -hmm. That's why they couldn't come up with an access point when they originally started this. Mm -hmm. um, safety to the people, uh, rocks flying off the trucks, rocks, trucks overloaded, mm. flying off. Uh, we report this. Yeah, there's probably about four yeah. or five of the people that in these letters mentioned a lot of Rocks, yep. Windshields busted, tires punctured. Yeah, when you guys brought this up before, it, it made me think of the number eight highway when it used to come, come down Canada Street and Union, mm -hmm. or uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Similar. Union and yeah. Canada and all that stuff. So it would come right through Marysville. All the logging trucks yeah. would come whistling through there, windy, curvy, yeah. hilly. And then they got the new number eight kind of extension done and yeah. that saved yeah. some of that. And now here you guys are, what, eight, ten that. years later, the exact same thing. Well, there are no there are no kids on the road anymore. They don't walk there. No, they don't, they can't. There's nobody on their bikes anymore because they can. It's too dangerous. Yeah. And they can't play in their front yards because these rocks end up halfway yeah. to your house. And these yeah. houses have quite a setback because it's rural area, right? Yeah. And some of these rocks weigh six and eight pounds. So if it flies off a truck and it hits you, you'll probably suffer severe injury. You'll be in the hospital. And yeah. in the summer, at high production time, mm. you can get a truck a minute. That's over 500 a day. We can say that again? <laughs> yeah, a truck a, a, a minute? minute? A minute. truck a minute, yeah. A minute. Over 500 a day. And for the first three years, uh, Jerry and I would hear them going in there at 5 in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. We kept on complaining about the fact that they were... They were pushing the envelope with their hours. Now get this. Jerry counted them, right? I counted. And the then, day I counted. And they didn't believe it. <laughs> no, no, they didn't believe it. Yeah. No, they so they sent it. a government employee out to sit there and count them. And he's been counting for 14 weeks. And, and then you're going to be wondering. He's a professional the, person. Yeah. Where are the <laughs> results going, right? You're going to be wondering where do the results go. So they got the information and so what? But it created a job. They don't believe us, but we're supposed to believe them, I not guess. Just, that, just that's one, kind of what I get out of that, right? Not yeah. just one employee, two employees, county. Double check. 
<laughs> My goodness. I'm going to read you just a little tiny thing that I think punctuates a lot of what we've been talking about with the government in particular. I sent this letter off to somebody whose name you can you can use if you want. He was the premier of the province. And I said, a quarry was imposed upon our longstanding residential agricultural zone in Estes Bridge in 2014. No attempt was made at all to reconcile the opposing interests in this regard when it was. Area residents like ourselves weren't even duly apprised of the decision to approve the siting of such a quarry within the residential agricultural zone until months after the decision was made. When a quarry is imposed upon one in a long-standing residential agricultural zone, the reasonable person wants to know why. We'd appreciate a real conversation about what's been going on in our valley, reasonably. I signed it. Right to information request. Here's the letter. Here's the marginal comment. Spoke with Heather, October 19, 2015. Put with others. Do not reply. This is your government. Is this the way to build a better economy? Is this how you, are you so afraid of people with questions that you, you know, they didn't want this out. This was a goof in the right to information. Well, they put it out there. They've been pretty successful in and this making is, sure it hasn't gotten out also. So Heather here and Sherry Guitard at the uh, Department of Environment, this is what they're doing. I think it was Heather Armstrong who was, was related. Heather is Heather Armstrong. These two spent a part of their highly amply paid morning basically saying who cares about this letter who cares about this guy who cares about this community no need to reply put with others i assume that there were other letters like this that were being written by some of my my friends and neighbors mm. isn't that contemptuous this is government representing you this is your this is how you're building economies yeah. in new brunswick and all that's going to add to your stress levels so there's the dust and the noise, but there's that as well. The local service district advisory committee is elected by the people who live out here. Mm -hmm. And after I retired, I thought, well, that's something I could get involved in. Why not? Selling me, I thought that an advisory committee would actually be someone who got the minister would come to for advice. Mm -hmm. But in the f four years of the quarry operation, despite numerous requests, we never got to speak to him about our concerns. So, I mean, I don't know why we have an election and I don't know why we have a committee and frankly don't know why we have a government. Can I read you a poem? Yeah, quickly. I wrote this uh, <laughs> night before Christmas poem a couple of years ago <laughs> and I'd like to read it because it's, it basically, I think, summarizes everything we've been talking about here. It's called The Night Before Christmas. The Twas the night before Christmas, and down by the stream a turtle was having a terrible dream. Hard but fair questions, a hundred or more, were not being answered by whom they were for. No one would touch them. That's not what we do. Be thankful we're working in such ways for you. The questions kept mounting. They weren't playing nice, so a lawyerly elf was brought in for advice. They're pretty good questions, he said with a grin. If you don't take my counsel, they'll do you all in. He was dressed all in fur from his tail to his foot, and what clothes he was wearing were tarnished with soot. The stump of a pipe was clenched tight in his teeth, spewing smoke that encircled his horns like a wreath. Your cage has been rattled, your bells have been rung. Now how to save face, he asked, forking his tongue. When you're backed into corners and the going gets tough, don't admit, don't deny, I can't say this enough. Then he pounded his trident, setting off quite a clatter, causing casements to fissure and windows to shatter. Come, Willful, come, Blindness, come, Serge, Kelly, Perry. Come, Don't Ask and Don't Tell, come, Talk Show Host, Terry. More rapid than eagles, these coursers now came, as he texted and tweeted and called them by name. They posed for group selfies with whoop shrieks and whistles, then rocketed skyward like heat-seeking missiles. The elf was heard smirking just ere he too flew. You'll be damned if you don't, you'll be damned if you do. But this was discounted. He must have misspoke. How totally unlike so tip-top a bloke. There are nightmares we wake to and nightmares we dream. So which was the turtles down there by the stream? Amen. To wrap up, you want to each of you give us some final thoughts? What's running through my head is <clears throat> what would give you some peace? Resolution what would give peace? me some peace? Yes. I don't get much peace, but... If I was uh, in another area, I, I will not get any peace living there. I enjoy my property. It's beautiful property along the stream. 
I've been there for 30 years, and I would I said I would never sell it, but you can't. I now. would be out in a minute if I could. And that that's what we live through every day, every single day except the weekend. The noisy trucks with rocks and dust. I I cannot put up with it anymore. I heard um, Minister Carr upbraiding David Kuhn one day. He said that David Kuhn sucked and blowed, and I have that footage, which I could use, I guess. But I would say to Jeff Carr, you're sucking and blowing when it comes to everything to do with the Myra Quarry. You are the sucker and the blower. You have received a lot of hard questions, and you are ducking for cover. We'd like to see a little bit more leadership from you with respect to the quarry. And I think that the only reasonable thing to do with that quarry is to shut it down. It started with a misrepresentation. People are being severely hurt by it and victimized by it. You cannot continue this. The questions are only going to get tougher. I, I think, as I said previously, the only way to solve all of the issues that we're concerned about is to close the quarry. And I don't suggest that he should suffer economically from that, um, but it's what needs to be done. That quarry, we're not only concerned about Nashwaxa Stream, that quarry sits on top of the third largest aquifer in Canada, I believe. Yes. And if they puncture that, we can't clean it. And there was a quarry on the Carlisle Road, right? Yeah. And they went through. And they closed it. And they closed it. Closed so I guess we have to wait for that. Yeah. But I, I it's, it's the people, it's the environment, it's the traffic, it's the danger. There's, they, there's no matter what they do, they can't ameliorate all of those concerns. So they need to find another place for him to mine his rock. Thank you for this, and thank you for all the work you've done for people, actually, to bring this forward. <clears throat> okay? Thank you. Good. Thank you for watching. <clears throat> we'll put some links up on so you can find the other uh, video clips that were referred to during the interview. and. Uh, if you like the work we do, please support the show. Go to dentistreport.ca and click on PayPal or Patreon. As always, be good, have fun, and love each other.